Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Cohen, the author of an introduction to the art and science of Chinese tea ceremony. Today, we're discussing Book Two, Chapter Three, Sections One and Two, an abbreviated history of Yixing teapots, the origin of Yixing ceramics, and the origin of teapots. Here to talk about this chapter is our editorial team, Patrick Penny. Hey, hey. And Zongjun Li. Hello, 大家好 Hello, Pat. Hello, Zongjun. My first question. Why are ceramics so integral to Chinese culture? I think I'm going to let Zhongjun take this one.、Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Ceramic has been part of、um, Chinese culture and Chinese life in the past few thousand years. Chinese people use ceramic to construct vessels, anywhere from things to hold liquid, to hold food, to hold bone ashes. So,、uh, as people start to In integrate this vessel into their daily life, and as also you know, culture changes from dynasty to dynasty. We have been seeing a lot of changes and var variations and evolution、um, of usage of ceramic、um, in many aspects of Chinese life. Many cultures had developed ceramic traditions around、uh, cookware, mortuary wear, and around the the use of ceramics in daily life. Yet it was predominantly China that brought ceramics to its artistic height. Why did the aesthetic tradition develop so strongly in ceramics in China versus、uh, elsewhere, for example, Europe,、uh, where they focused on metalware、uh, and other artistic pursuits? I'll、uh, take a little stab at it. It's not that、uh, the Chinese culture didn't have any of those metalwares. I know for you know mortuary wares and funerary.、Um, You know, tribute type wares. They they did move to bronze for some of the、uh, higher class members of society. For、uh, I would say,、uh, from what I remember, pre Tang. But you, you do have, I think, a group of people who are situated in a very、uh, fertile plain, right? That has such ready access to high quality clay、um, that. It, it just was available, literally at their at their feet and their fingertips, and it was the wear that you know through as Zongjun said the dynasties continued to transform with the cultures,、uh, and you know at, at the earliest times, even when wares were highly functional,、um, a lot of the mythology and storytelling、uh, can be seen in motifs in the wares, and I think obviously that's that's passed on through the dynasties as you see kind of these this mythology. Described and translated through different motifs that build in skill and technique, and eventually reach the this kind of pinnacle,、uh, where the the Chinese culture had a, a much higher degree of skill in all the forms they were able to achieve in ceramic wares.、Uh, when you compare them、uh, at the same relative time point to、uh, Europe, right? I mean, they were able to achieve proto porcelain,、uh, you know, by by and actually before the Tang、uh, or proto celadon, celadon rather. Uh, you know, it's a culture that just had such a fast advancement relative to the rest of the world in ceramics,、um, because so much of their daily life、uh, depended on these ceramic wares to, like, live, to to drink, to eat,、uh, and to convey stories, right? And I also think that there's a very important part,、uh, especially when it comes to、uh, usage of、uh, utensils or wares in ceremonial contexts.、Um, Long-lasting and longevity is a very important component of the wares, because metal rust, you know, they rot,、um, they go away, and、uh, uh, glazing technique wasn't like super advanced back in the old days, and gold or you know silver are very very expensive, but ceramic lasts and also jade lasts. So those are two、um, very common material that we've been seeing、um, to forge ceremonial utensils. Uh, throughout Chinese history, yeah, I mean, we still have、um, you know wares from Shang and Xia dynasties, right? So thousands of years、uh, yeah. that are relatively、uh, good condition. I mean, you can find、uh, quite a lot of pictures online or in, in good、um, books, and even some pieces in、uh, museums, which is amazing to think of. You know, dirt that is、uh, not even high fired because they hadn't achieved high fire wear. Let's let's say you know pre kind of.、Um, Warring states period, but、uh, these these low fired wares still to this day last, even though some of the decorations or plied pigments may have faded.、Uh, the shape is is still in quite good condition. And a lot of these wares are for burial、uh, purpose, right? Like you expect them to last on the ground. 
And uh, for all the precious irons and browns they can acquire in daily life, a lot of them, you know, they, they need to actually use them, uh, whether or not it's for military, whether or not it's for ceremonial contexts. But I think one of the very uh, important reasons is that, you know, these wares will last on the ground and then they're relatively cheaper than, you know, uh, metals or browns or irons back in the days. So Jason, do you have a different viewpoint from what we've said on why ceramic wares have such a have achieved such a high level of artistry in China uh, relative to the rest of the world? Well, I think that you both uh, really focused on the early development of Chinese wares and the early development of the ceramic traditions, um, particularly in the focus of mortuary wares, where they are originally used and refined for artistic uh, purposes. But the overall height of ceramics happens much later throughout dynastic China. And I believe it's very tightly tied to the demands of the imperial household uh, and the use of patronization and the use of official orders uh, and the gifting of those official orders out to other scholars, other literati, other mandarins who worked within the government that created a unified uh, artistic style throughout China. Uh, China is one of the few places where you can see specific shifts in style, specific adoption of techniques based exclusively on the preferences of the emperor and the promotion of the emperor's uh, aesthetic style was used both as a soft power, it was used as a way of drawing uh, the populace closer, uh, and particularly in the later Chinese history, in the Qing dynasty, it was used as a form of cultural inclusion, blending some of the European uh, overglaze enamel painting uh, techniques with Manchu preferences in order to create uh, a new imperial style. That top-down approach, as we, as we spoke about in book one, was not popular everywhere, right? Not every uh, Han literati adopted the imperial style. But anyone close to the uh, imperial palace, anyone close to uh, working for the government certainly had to at least learn to appreciate uh, such developments. So, you know, it is always difficult to attribute things specifically to, to government action when it's uh, part of a collective adoption of preferences. Uh, but in this case, we have very clear evidence over the evolutionary and adaptations of uh, technique and preferences. Um, uh, very well tied to uh, official orders and patronage. So I, I think it's interesting that, you know, as you said, Dong Jun and I went went early. Uh, you're going a little bit later, right? After I would say the the aesthetic and the, the technique really developed to the pinnacle of its heights and uh, the whole world, right, was demanding uh, Chinese imperial wares. The the question originally was, you know, why, why is, why have the wares of the Chinese culture uh, reached such an artistic height. And I feel like the answer lies somewhere in between, right? The two time periods that we provided. Why did the cultures surrounding the development of these wares, why did they seek to make better and better and better wares? You know, when I, when I think about it, there's obviously some of the uh, like philo philosophical practices that kind of shaped daily life, right? So Buddhism, Taoism, you know, Confucianism, various other practices that probably um, would push artisans to try and reach uh, certain degrees of skill. But, you know, for people who are using day-to-day -day wares, uh, even, even a lot of the daily wares reach such a high level and degree of skill compared to the rest of the world, it really does leave me kind of thinking, why? Why did the artisans develop such high-quality wares? Obviously, the technique later on was pushed and pushed by uh, a top-down approach. And early on, it has to do with people just wanting to live their life and survive. And at what point do artisans start to have this drive to make something that is better and better and better that was than what was made before? So I think there's something interesting there, but I don't have answers. I, I entirely agree that there's something very interesting there. And I'll take the uh, rare approach of quoting uh, Henry Kissinger, as Henry Kissinger so aptly observed, China is a big country. And what that means is that you have many ceramic centers and early market economy, early merchantification of China, uh, the early urbanization of China led to inter-regional competition. Uh, there was a unified market, a unified trade, and for historical 
heartland of China, there were many different areas that uh, clay and kilns could be mined and refined. When you think about where metal came from throughout China, there were certainly copper mines, but no one really builds uh, beautiful wares out of copper. Um, most of the tin mines and most of the formation of pewter happened at the frontier lands, either outside of China's economic core, uh, or sending individuals into the Malaysian Peninsula, uh, or into Yunnan, uh, where frequently they either had to fight off the local indigenous uh, Mekong uh, headwater tribes, uh, or they had to uh, talk them into working in uh, metal mines. So for China, being both a large country and a unified market with an early urbanization uh, and a merchant economy, it created the means for inter-regional competition and trade, which created a need to rapidly progress uh, in, their, in their formation and their abilities. And you see the rise and fall of various ceramic centers, right? You had the Shiwan kilns uh, in Guangdong as a later example that attempted to compete with Yixing and attempted to compete with Jun wares from Hunan and Hubei. And those wares uh, were appreciated for a time uh, and then things continued to move. And when you then think about, once again, the imperial support to, to Jingdezhen and the imperial workshop, it's very difficult to, to disconnect the uh, government actions and support of the industry with their continued and sustained developments. Yeah, I think regional competition is a very interesting angle to view this. And also, you know, throughout Chinese history, you, not only you have the so-called official kiln, right? Like the five largest uh, famous kiln, Ge Wu Guan Ding Jun, Jason just mentioned Jinware, but you also have like a lot of these, what we call civil kilns, like for example, Zizhou Yao. It's one of the more famous uh, civil kiln back in Song and Yuan dynasty. So all of these uh, local influences have, um, you know, crystallized from empirical or um, official influences from official kilns, but that cascade down into, you know, people's daily life. I guess my thoughts uh, when, you know, Song Jun and I were talking, we're going from local rural kilns and I skipped over to the Jingdezhen with your answer, Jason, and left out Jian Yao and Ding and Xing and Ge and Ru and all the fun ones. So there's a lot of development in the middle there. Which leads me to my second and last question for this first chapter. Chinese culture has a habit of linking new innovations to ancient traditions. How has this habit affected Yixing wares? the mystical and magical and ever sought after Yixing wares of the Song dynasty. Oh no, I think you mean of the Tang dynasty. Of the Tang dynasty. Where, where do these myths come from and why are they so prevalent? Almost all of the ceramic artistic traditions are, are in some way, shape or form, and that shape being the particular emphasis, uh, you know, linked back to older ceramic traditions. And so, you know, when we think about the ewers, right, used for oil tea, right, in the, the Tang or potentially slightly before the Tang, right, Sui and Jin dynasties, we, we see these shapes for older ewers and even as they move into the Song, we see a lot of those shapes pulled from to form the basis of a lot of early teapots uh, in the Ming and into the Qing. And so we, we do see a call back to specific form from earlier wares being implemented in Yixing. Um, but when it comes to mythology, that one's a little harder for me. Uh, obviously, we see in, um, you know, enamel or over overpainted Yixings, a lot of motifs represented, which uh, have their basis in, you know, earlier art forms throughout the Chinese culture and aren't specific to ceramics. Um, and some of these motifs can help lend to, you know, uh, mythos around the art form of Yixing. But particular myths, like as you were alluding to, the, the great Yixings of, uh, let's say, Song or Tong, <laughs> whatever you want to say, the great Yixings of Shang Dynasty, uh, you know, mythology that emphasizes how much older or grander the tradition is than it, than it truly uh, was. Uh, I, ha I have trouble finding, you know, specific reasons uh, as to how that developed. I guess tea in and of itself, when we look at like uh, Lu Yu's Cha Jing, right? Lu Yu pulled from so many disparate threads to try and make tea sound like a, a much grander and more fully fleshed out tradition uh, than it truly was at, at, I think, the time that he wrote the Cha Jing. Uh, and I think, you know, Yixing and many other art forms kind of go through that same cycle of uh, 
you know, to to make the, the power of their art form stronger, to make it more prevalent, more prominent and important uh, within the culture, they try and pull links back to the past to showcase reasons why uh, this specific art form is important and how it does have a very solid flag in the ground for Chinese culture uh, on, on the whole, right? For the Chajing, pulling back to stories of Shen Nong, uh, I mean, how much, how much greater do you get than, you know, the second, third uh, mythical emperor of China being, being the founder of tea. Uh, now I'm sure there's probably similar myths for Yixing, but I can't, I can't personally point to them. Maybe Zong Jun or, or you, Jason, can help in that realm. That's an interesting angle. I cannot think of any tangible example for that. But the, the monks at Golden Sand Temple, of course. <laughs> the Golden Sand Temple. I'm unfamiliar, Jason. Please, please enlighten us. The mythology is that there were monks at a Golden Sand Temple, Jin Jinsha uh, Ji. Jinsha uh, Jin, yeah. Uh, and they created these teapots for for tea. Uh, and it was a, a, a servant who learned how to form the teapots from the monks after, after many days of going and visiting and enjoying the tea. There does not seem to be any evidence of that myth, but it's also, it's also unclear if uh, Golden Sands Temple existed at that time or if it was built and named that later. So very, very much part of the, the broader mythology. I don't know. I think that's a perfect example. Zongjun, does anything else come to mind for you? I, I think for me, I um, don't think I spent enough time we, reading like bad Wikipedia articles about how uh, Yixing came about. So I'm sure if I did, I'd, I'd have a lot more on hand. Yeah, well, not necessarily. I mean, the, the origin of Yixing till today remains a unknown mystery. Like when exactly did it started, so who exactly made the first Yixing teapot was, you know, still a mystery. Also, you know, throughout Chinese history and also like in a lot of things, you know, not just uh, in the tea world, but also in the art world, there is this notion called tonggu, right? Like to tribute or uh, pay your respect to the old, um, to the ancient. Um, so I found that uh, pretty relevant to a lot of uh, evolution in, in ceramic and also ev evolution in uh, Yixin Tipa in particular. For example, like people, you know, even in modern days, you know, still trying to do uh, what, what is so-called replica or tribute to a certain type of ancient shape, like, you know, Meng Chen or Da Bing shape. So those idea is that, you know, to link your more refined modern technique, but still has a tangible root to a, you know, ancient origin, I think is the intention of uh, a lot of these, uh, you know, ancient makers and ceramic makers. Switching gears to the origins of teapot, this chapter speaks of telos. What is telos and why, in summary, do teapots exist? To drink tea! Uh, I honestly had to Google search telos when we were writing the first book. It's like the, uh, the end purpose, right? Just to help me understand this, since English yeah. is my second language. <laughs> yeah, oh, oh, I think it's this, this overall a total goal in tea. I think uh, we, we set out to establish a telos when we were setting up the first book, right? There's, there's a reason you brew tea. There are techniques you can use to do it well, right? So uh, Gong Fu Cha, right, has a, has a telos. And so teapots also have a raison d'etre. You're not using them just because they look pretty. When you apply this, you know, artistic wear to uh, your practice, uh, the aim is obviously to to take the tea and do do something better with it than would be done with other wares. Uh, so hopefully to allow your tea or the brew to to reach kind of a higher height. How did wine wear influence the culture of tea? As we see from a lot of early wares and many of the wares that you actually provided pictures of in this chapter. A lot of early wares were, were actually meant to hold both liquids. So we have cups that were used interchangeably for tea and wine. Um, many, you know, high level scholars and officials would be having gatherings where they are being served. Alcoholic beverages often, which could take the form of a hot alcoholic beverage. Uh, and you provide some more detail in the book when those officials would maybe want to be sobered up a little bit, uh, or, you know, if their party was just going on all day and they need a little bit of something to pick them up. Um, it, it wouldn't be strange for tea to also be taking form in that same cup. Um, and we see poetry not only on cups themselves, but uh, poetry taking shape around the same time, um, which links the two quite inextricably. And, you know, when we think about the Buddhists, right, um, 
monks were supposedly not supposed to be partaking in alcohol. Uh, and, you know, there's uh, some, some great books, which can, I think, uh, provide examples of otherwise. But, you know, many of the tea wares uh, of the time that, that potentially monks would have been using um, are pulled not just from look and shape of other medicinal wares of the time, but also wares that would have been used for alcohol. And so uh, you have quite a blurring of, of the two uh, types of wares that would be utilized for those beverages. Yeah, definitely agree. A lot of these uh, literati gatherings back in the days will you know, oftentimes drink, um, you know, oftentimes first drink tea and then followed by large consumption of alcohol. It's uh, the moment when a lot of great calligraphies and poetry, you know, from Li Po or Wang Xizhi started. And today, and today, our brushwork remains best when early on the bomber peak. Yeah, a little bit of caffeine in you and just the right amount of uh, alcohol. Although we're not drinking any uh, Huangzhou or anything like that. Not, not often. <laughs> I love Huangzhou though. It's Chinese sherry. Speaking of Huangzhou and of wine, uh, are there any types of wine wares still used by contemporary tea practitioners? It's a good question. I feel like it should be thrown right back at you as the uh, relative wine expert within our group. Well, I do love my uh, aged wine decanter. I use it as a gigantic gongdao bay for, <laughs> for aeration. <laughs> no, uh, the only types of wineware that I am would, would consider using for tea remain cups, ceramic cups, and particularly dahua cups that are, were, were made for both tea and wine. And I, and I think those maintain a great aroma delivery. You know, part of it is that there's not many wares in contemporary use and contemporary production for wine that are made for hot wine. Um, hot wine is, has become very, you know, very, very specific. Some people will drink glue vine around uh, Christmas time. Uh, other people drink hot mold wine deep winter. Um, but those things are, are, are relatively uncommon. Uh, and so because of that, I think that the majority of, of I, I don't really think that there are that many wine wares in use by tea practitioners. When we look at tea ceremony specifically, I would, I would totally agree with that. But um, when we look at just tea connoisseurship and the broader culture, when it comes to iced teas, and when I think about actually Japanese uh, iced teas or more cold brew or mizudashi style of brewing, wine glasses are really heavily used actually um, in the enjoyment, right, and connoisseurship of high quality Japanese uh, mizudashi or koridashi teas. That, that was something that I was kind of surprised to see when I would go to tea tastings in Japan was, um, you know, you'd have your Hario kind of ice brewer, uh, but then we would be enjoying teas, not in a, you know, fine uh, Raku cup or anything like that, but often, you know, a Riddell glass or something of that sort. Um, so in, in the broader culture, I think we are seeing still uh, a melding uh, of wares from both practices. But um, when it comes to the ceremony itself, yeah. You're, you're not about to pour, uh, you know, delicious hot tea into a Riddell glass. Uh, I don't do it too frequently, at least. Circling back to Telos, I had a question that I wanted to end on, which is why I didn't follow up for the previous question. But my question is, what does a teapot enable you to do that no other ware does? And if that's true, in an alternative timeline, what could have arisen in place of a teapot? Well, in comparison to one of the other more commonly used brewing vessels is Gaiwan. I think feel like using teapots um, to brew tea, you can definitely have a better control on, you know, water temperature, brewing, uh, pour, water pouring speed, also stratifi stratification of uh, tea into different cups, um, and also the impact of the Yixing uh, material itself to the tea has definitely a very drastic difference from usually Gai Wan, which is made out of porcelain. You know, you looked at it in a very tactical way, I think, Songjun. I think that what teapots are, enable you to do that other wares don't is they enable you to draw on the rich and uh, heavily mythological history uh, that teapots have that you you don't really find. Sure, Gai Wans have a history, tea bowls have a history, um, but no one's really trying to Kung Fu specifically in a tea bowl. Uh, not too frequently, at least. And so when it comes to tea ceremony and trying to brew tea at the highest levels that you are able to, uh, and when you are practicing kind of the phenomenological approach, teapots give you this element uh, of, of storytelling uh, and of history and the weight of mythology to lean into, which I think no other contemporary brewing ware enables. And does the material have an effect? Is that part of the reason that Yixings are so highly used? 
And is there anything that could have an, uh, a similar effect as, as Yixing? The shape, the material, it, it all matters. And um, I don't oh. know, maybe we just need a, you know, I'm, I'm thinking a, a clay ball that you have uh, wrapped in chains, right? You put your tea in the clay ball, you have a little cork you put on top and you just spin it around. You just spin it around, spin it, spin it, spin it. And then uh, you, you toss it into a cup that's sitting 100 yards down the field. Um, you get a goal. Uh, and also you brewed the best cup of tea possible with a uh, you know, chain, chain centrifuge. The, the centrifuge is used in, in Greek coffee. You fill the, the very fine grinds. You uh, basically whisk it together and then you spin it around the hot water or the coffee grinds to force the coffee grinds down. And then you skim off the, the liquid, leaving behind the slurry. Uh, that is, that is a legitimate technique in in Greek coffee, and it's it's cowboy tea as well. Can can we do it? Can it be done? That's the Kung Fu converge. Uh, Zongjun, where are you seeing in your mind that that will be better? Well, I was thinking about some other regional, uh, you know, ceramic wares like Chaozhou Kung Fu, um, Chaozhou teapot, uh, which is not made out of Asian clay, but also has a similar effect on you know tea uh, in terms of clay to uh, tea interaction. The, the question was also more general. Why don't we see more boiled tea? Why don't we see more tea that, that gets uh, pressed? Why don't we put tea in hot water in a blender, right? What, um, in, in some alternative timeline, what, what could have been? Well, all those things do happen. It's just not part of the culture or the ceremony, contemporarily, at least speaking, um, that we are all practicing. So certainly you go to coffee or tea shops and people are putting tea in French presses and you go to some different countries, right? It's it's still not uncommon to this day to be boiling tea. Um, and so it really comes down to the the praxis, right? That we're all a part of. And so I, I do think there could have been some different wear, um, but it is once again, the the weight of history that I think is helping to bolster the, the usage of teapots being um, so prevalent. Maybe there's some kind of strange dark timeline, you know, we're all brewing in like the Italian, you know, espresso maker, uh, the like percolator for all of our teas, you know, just delicious, fresh, fresh longjing going into a percolator. The, that dark timeline exists somewhere, but I think we're, we're lucky to be living in the uh, age we're living in where our practice has taken the shape it has uh, around teapots. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this edition of Tea Technique Editorial Conversations. Please join us again for our next conversation, Ming Dynasty Yixing History. Mm -hmm.